Hello YouTube. You're probably wondering why we're in the kitchen today. And if you obviously watch the full playthroughs of the sessions, you'll know this is where we play most of our games. Well, all of our games. Um, I'm doing a video from here today because with my groups on hiatus, uh, the D&D 5e group is on hiatus due to uh, one of the members being on holiday. Um, and the 1e group is on hiatus because the same member is uh, on holiday. Downside to having groups with lots of shared players, if one person's on holiday, it can mess with everything. But, c'est la vie. Mm. Got my cup of tea. And I did a poll on Twitter um, asking what people would like to see. And although there wasn't a lot of responses due to not having um, a great um, following on Twitter, so please like subscribe to both here and my twitter account i'm very active on twitter um with what's happening between sessions um i do i am thinking about possibly getting a discord as well if that's something that people are somewhat more interested in um but that's not important right now i asked basically would people be interested in watching me plan out a campaign particularly one of my larger encounters and Although there wasn't a lot of responses, the majority response was yes. So, that's what we're here for. So, I've got Card King Pro um, Infinity Dice Bag. Fantastic thing. You'll also recognise this from the videos. This is the house dice. Reason being is I don't use my personal dice when planning campaigns. Just a bit of um, superstition on my part. My reason being is I know how my dice roll... Um, that sounds so stupid when you say it out loud, but we all do it. Anyone who plays Dungeons & Dragons, we've got this opinion of our dice that they roll a certain way. So because of that, I use the house dice because then I'm not unfavouring my party. Okay, let's just get on and then you guys can see what I'm actually planning. So this is the 5e campaign because... Um, Anyone who does play 1E at the moment already knows how that system works. There's no real point doing a 1E encounter. If you want me to roll up a 1E encounter, then sure, I'll do it. But I'm rolling up a 5E encounter today. Um, oh, if this video comes out later, this is before the release of Tasha's um, Cauldron of Everything. Um, I am hoping to get that because um, in... A game I'm actually a player in, I am rolling as a Genasi with a genie patron, and we do now know that the warlock genie patron will be in Tasha's Guide to Everything, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Personally, I prefer genie patron over genie lord patron, but that's that. Okay, got my notes. So, the mission I'm going to be throwing them at is you'll know from the last episode of um, DLA, Dragonlance Archipelago that the party have arrived on a mysterious island. Um, they don't know where they are. Actually, this video will probably come out before that, so something to look forward to. Basically, they're going to wake up somewhere that isn't um, Dekterpot or uh, Elon. They're going to wake up on a different island. And as part of the island, part of being on the island, they have to help locals to speed up how quick they need to get away and each of the party members has a reason why they need to get away and that will be um, built on in story um, basically a bit of a, a little bit of a spoiler for you guys and any of them that watch though I know don't, not many of them do watch these videos because they don't want to spoil things themselves um, Arya will need to get away due to someone being after her um, Mooley will have to get away due to connection to the uh, Raven Queen. And Freslin will need to get moving due to his quest to collect the items of the Kitchen Goddess. Which is something I will go into a little bit of detail in this episode because that goes in my Book of Homebrew. So I'll be showing that in a moment. One of the missions they have, because they're in a swamp town, is that they will have to kill a swamp monster. And certain people around the town know little bits of information. So if the party go around and ask information, they will get more information, which will help them with the coming quest. And I've got it all written here. If they're able to 
speak to any of the chefs or cooks. They'll learn uh, that the swamp monster, monster has settled in a swamp in a salt mine near the old village of Sola Sabar, which is further out into the uh, swamp. Now, a bit of a naming convention here. The reason it's called Solos Abar is because um, when Fresden comes across it, he'll find out that that was the birthplace of um, Giovanni, the last champion of fucking Nigella Lawson. <laughs> Why do I let players homebrew so much? Um, oh yeah, because it's fun. They will. Uh, it's called Solos Abar because Solos, for anyone that's a Dragon Age fan, means lonesome or lonely in Latin, and Giovanni directly translates to a Japanese word uh, meaning a type of tree, and arbor is the Latin word for tree. So that's how I get the names for some of my villages. Other villages I come up with a word and then I just move the letters around. Um, for example, they're going to be on the island of Yakristor. Yakristor is just first island, just all the letters moved around. Or is it Start Island? It's Start Island. That's what it was. Yeah, screw it. It's something like... The problem is I never make notes of what the original word was, purely because then I can't um, dictate it too much. But yeah, Yafristor was a um, was another two words that I moved around. From the library or the way of... Uh, or a um, scholar of a certain temple um, known as the Way of Five Heads. Uh, their leader, they'll learn that the village was the home of um, Giovanni Contaldo, who was the champion of Nigella. Now, anyone who is a cooking fan knows that Giovanni Contaldo is a very famous Italian chef who went on to teach Jamie Oliver. So that's how I get things like that in. <laughs> The, the level of just pulling bullshit from thin air just to um, add things to characters' backstory. From the guard captain, uh, they can learn that the mine has three floors uh, and has been infested by monsters for decades. So, there's going to be shit in there. And if they go to a local crime lord, who they will be getting submissions from, a gentleman who goes by the mediator because I am not um, all that clever when it comes down to naming NPCs. Um, they will find out that it was him who released the monster into the swamp in an attempt to take back an outpost that had been overrun by lizard men, which will be another mission that the party will have. And because of that, I wound up deciding what the first monster was right before even starting. So you can see how much already goes into this just to make sure the party doesn't fucking die. And the monster they'll be fighting, I just opened the page on it and it was like, that is exactly what I need to throw at them. Is, not a skeleton, here we go, the Shambling Mold. It is a challenge rating 5, large plant unaligned. Now the party at this point should be level 4, if they go in a bit early they'll be level 3. If they wind up leaving this till last, they might very well be level 5. This whole section of this campaign is going to be taking them from halfway through level 3 up to just about level 5, if not a little bit higher. And that is what they'll be fighting, a shambling mould. And then we need to start building the dungeon. And that's where you come in. So, we know that there are three floors to the dungeon. And we know the dungeon is in the village of Salasabar. So, let's start with a map of Salasabar. We write it down very quick. I don't know why I'm going to show you that, because it just says Salasabar. I am pronouncing it weird, I know it's, it is Solus Arbor. But when I say it to the group, it'll be Salasabar. Almost like it's one word. And that again keeps things just this side of um, not being too obviously normal. So we're going to take 66 straight off the bat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Perfect. And I'm going to roll those on the table. Now, anyone who has seen 
map building on things like Pinterest will know this style. Basically, we're going to roll the dice and that will be the layout for the village. And if any of them roll a six, that will be the entrance to the mine. There we go. We have a six. So that went outside of the lines of my paper. So the shape of the village forms the shape of the dice. Oh, that's almost too perfect because the entrance of the mine is in a lower left-hand corner of the village. Ah, the sun's out. Lovely. Larry, isn't that nice? Yeah, you'll notice Larry has come down with me. He comes in all my videos, especially for planning. Jenny is also in the room at the moment, though she's being very pleasantly quiet. It's okay, you can talk. Hello. I don't mind Jenny being here when I'm D and D planning. For one thing, um, as she's pointed out herself, herself, when it comes down to Dungeons and Dragons stuff, especially me planning, she mostly tunes me out, which works for me perfectly. Sometimes you do need someone who you can talk to about things. And when it comes down to the D and D five E game, I will be talking to Jenny, my wife, the lovely Aria from the five E game, and if you watch the one E game, Father Zed, uh, who is a fellow games master. In the 1E game, again, I'll be talking to Jenny because she has a bad memory for remembering facts and figures and locations and things. Especially when it comes down to me going on and on about D&D, which I do. Or I'll be talking to my older brother, who plays Freslin in the 5E campaign. And that way I can bounce ideas off and hear them. That is something I really do advise to games masters and honest, writers as well. We do need people who we can kind of bounce things off and just hear things back from. But let's get back to this. So we know that it has to be an entrance to a salt mine, which means that in the left hand area, there should be a bit of a rocky outcropping. So there we go. And then mark the entrance with an arrow. I always mark um, entrances and exits using arrows just to make things easier for myself for notes later. Now, we're going to want to populate the place with some buildings, make it look like an actual demolished area. For that, I like to use D4s, because D4s, when you roll them, they just stop. So, let's take, let's see, it would have been a um, medium settlement, basically. So not big enough to be a city, but just a bit bigger than a village. So a town, so let's go with six. And we roll within the circle, okay. Some of those came out of the circle, about three of them did. So we re-roll back into the circle. There we go. And these are our building plots. Okay, so we've got one larger building in the northern edge of the area. We've got another two off to the left. And we have one very small one in the southern end, far away from the entrance of the mine. Now let's work out the reason for that. Now I would say the reason for that is that monsters regularly come out at night and have probably um, damaged, destroyed, scavenged or salvaged what little there is. Now it's important to work out what kind of monsters we're going to be having in, the, uh, in there. I know two already and if they do another mission they'll get a hint at one of the monsters in there. Um, if you have the monster manual you'll know this creature. If you don't, I heartily recommend it for um, underground encounters with parties who have lots of very heavy damaging members. My party has a sorcerer and a barbarian, two very heavy damagers. Quagoths. You can see there. Quagoths. Medium humanoid, chaotic neutral, basically um, wendigos, for a better phrase. And they are... A bit tough. Then they're, they're not too bad. They only do D6 plus three slashing damage and get two attacks per turn with a plus five to hit. That said, um, when they hit ten hit points and less, they then do an additional two D6 damage with every attack. So they get nastier the closer to death they are. Earlier in the game, the party will meet a pair of quagoths and a quagoth thonot. A quagoth thonot is a um, quagoth mage. So a little bit of magic. Let's see if I can um, make them sweat under the collar a little bit. But challenge rating levels, 
all of those are fine. The two Quagoths and the Quagoth Thonot, that is a deadly rating for a four-man band of level four characters. Um, at the point that they'll be meeting that, that'll be a bit fair. I have to gradiate this due to many of the party members having magic weapons or um, uh, very powerful weapons. For example, obviously you've got um, Lenny. I have to account for Barbarian having a great sword that does 2d12 damage. Um, and with Breslin, I have to account for his um, trident counting as a magic weapon. And of course, Arya now has the um, vicious rapier. Which, although its effect only applies on a critical hit, it does still count as a magic weapon. So, magical immunities we need to account for. So, let's not throw some quagoths at them just yet. I want to save those for a little bit once they're actually inside the dungeon. So, what would be something? We know there are definitely plant creatures within this region. I think I've just worked out what I need to throw at them. Um, it's a monster I plan on using in the dungeon quite a bit. And this is the thing. Most videos you see about D&D planning, the dungeon master has everything planned out well in advance. I do not. I start building it and then I go with what I feel is right. And honestly, I will a long time just open the book and go that. That looks nasty. That looks mean. That looks fun. And I just realised this town is a damaged and decrepit town um, that has been left abandoned. And there is a swamp monster, uh, particularly a shambling mole beneath. The monster I'll be throwing at them this round. Myconids. Myconids are not complex enemies. But if you've ever watched The Last of Us, basically the clickers. So, I already had the idea of there being some Myconids for the party to fight anyway. So, let's roll up a couple of Myconids for them to fight. A basic Quag uh, Quagoth Spore Servant has a challenge rating of 1 in the book. I'm going to go with... I could throw some Myconid adults at them. What else, Commander? That's a Spore Servant. Uh, do, 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 do. I fully intend for them to fight the Myconid Sovereign as well. Um, again, if you know the book, it's not an overly difficult enemy. Challenge rating of 2, 450 experience points. But having the opportunity to use Myconids through the dungeon should put the party on edge a little bit. But also train them in how to fight plant-based enemies. Because they do share a lot of similarities with... Um, the Shambling Mole, due to both being plant enemies. So, Myconids. Let's throw a fight encounter there. So I always denote overworld fight encounters with an X. Now the question is, do I throw something a bit scary at them, or do I throw something a bit more interesting at them? You know what? I... <laughs> you'll note from some of the videos, I like horror. I like throwing horror at my party, and... Apparently my party think I'm quite good at it, so let's stick to what I'm good at. So, let's have a pincer movement. They can search the buildings, we'll work out what's in those buildings in a moment. Uh, we'll number each of those buildings, one, two, three, four, and five. I'm thinking as they approach the dungeon, the dungeon entrance, they will encounter some Myconid uh, servants. I'm just thinking humans, to be honest. I'll just look up some human stats, and then we'll roll up. What I threw at them last time that was kind of mean, it was the um, Sapo Games. And you remember from that video, it was a um, rolling fight of 10 Sapo Games against my PQR. Uh, remember, everyone, the most important thing for a Dungeon Master is to know your alphabet because they still only make the monster manual in alphabetic order, not in challenge rating order. And that is a pain in the neck. Here we go, Soho Games. Soho Games have a challenge rating of a half, whereas uh, Myconid, well, Quagoth Myconid um, servants, they have a challenge rating of one. So it would be a bit mean to throw 
ten of them. That's like twice as hard as the Saho games. Now that said, they are absolutely not as hard. You actually look at the abilities and you can see they're not as hard as the Saho games. Yeah, they get their multi-attack, but they only have one, uh, two attacks. Both attacks do uh, D6 plus 3 if you're dealing with um, uh, the Quagoths. I'm going to throw some humans at them. So, let's flip the page. Always write your notes on the other side of the page to the map you are working with. That way, you are less likely to mix things up. So, we have house 1, house 2, house 3, house 4, and house 5. And we then have the X marker, which is the combat. So, using the Dungeon Master's book, we'll look at what buildings can be. So, you want to go to the village planner. There's a lot of this that might just get a jump cut. I'm just going to say that right now. And that is purely because I don't think you guys want to be looking at me just looking through a book. I mean, if you wanted me to do that, I've got enough books I could do. But I don't think you'd want to just watch me sat at a table looking through book after book after book. Okay, so we're going to look at building type. You go to page 113 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, and you're going to need the old favourite of D&D, D20. So, first building is a 2, which is a residence. It's a big residence, I can say that. The second building, 11, which gives us a religious building. Church of the Shrews. Thank you, Jenny. Sorry. Okay. Um, the next building, 18. We have a shop. So, a derelict and decrepit shop. And four will be another 11. Oh, too many religious buildings in one area. Reroll if you feel is appropriate. There we go, a tavern. I do love a nice haunted town, to be honest. 18, that gives us another shop. Perfect. And there we have completely randomly generated a perfectly reasonable um, settlement. Obviously, at one time, there may have been more residential buildings. What has been left is the largest of the residential buildings around the main square. So we take the D20 and we will roll to find out what the hell this was. 13. Should have been a crowded tenement. So basically, uh, apartment complex, flats. That makes sense for a large building. So it is abandoned. All of these buildings will be abandoned. And... As a residence, it was a um, somewhere that people lived, somewhere, uh, basically apartment complex. We will be populating that in a moment. But not with enemies. The fight doesn't happen yet. Yeah, I, you could do it that this is a whole extra dungeon they go through there, but I'm not thinking it's that big. I'm thinking when it says crowded tenement, maybe like four apartments built into one building. Um, and that's what they'll be dealing with, four rooms. I'll plan out a small map of that, and I'll plan out what's in each room. As for the religious building, temple to a good or neutral deity. So, a minor temple. We can do with that. Now, if we want to find out what the deity is, we go to the uh, player's handbook. And you go towards the back, past the spell table, past the different effects, and you'll find on page 294 of the player's handbook a list of deities. Now, we need a good or neutral. Let's just go with something random. Let's use the back end of the pen. Well, that's neutral evil. We can't use um, Merkel, God of Death. Also, this is taking place in a sort of facsimile of the Dragonlance universe. Um, obviously, with the current situation with Wizards of the Coast and Dragonlance, I am separating my own canon from Dragonlance 
quite a bit. Uh, basically, I'm going to be opting for um, Kryn in my world is uh, more an island or a different country on the same planet, rather than it being a different planet. Because I don't need any more shit. Thank you. Let's try that then. So, we have the... To be honest with the, the deities of Dragonlance, we do have gods in neutrality and gods are good. So, let's take a d10. Odds good. Even neutral. Even neutral. It was a 10. Well, zero. So, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's roll us a d8. And on an 8, re-roll. That's a 7. So, it will be the temp a minor temple to Lunatari. Lunatari. The goddess of neutral magic. So, that tells us a little bit already. And this is just village building. This isn't even actually the actual dungeon. We're not even at that bit, that bit yet. Throw the D8 back. Okay, a shop. Let's roll out the tavern first. So we need to know what kind of tavern it was. It was a seven. It was a dive bar. But that doesn't really matter. Let's find out the name. Again, on page uh, 113 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, it does give you optional names. Obviously, you can come up with your own names. Sometimes I do. For example, the Fetid Armpit, which I got from one of my players if you're watching that episode. Jesus Christ. Okay, the tavern, it has the name of the Howling and a 15 gives us Mountain, the Howling Mountain. And it was a dive bar. Okay, now the shops. So again, we turn over the page in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which takes us to page 114. Which gives us the shop table. We can work out what shops these were. Eight. A money lender. So a minor bank. If you're being nice, otherwise, mob boss. And a 15. Gives us a baker. Yep, 15 is baker. Fantastic. So those are the buildings that the party can interact with. Just right at the start. Just getting into... The actual dungeon before the dungeon actually starts. You alright, love? Sorry, I was looking up, sorry. Oh, fair enough, that's alright. So, what can they find in each place? Well, for that, we'll be turning to the player's handbook very quickly. We're going to go to the inventory section, the equipment. What might they find? We're also going to use this as an opportunity to work out how many enemies are going to be coming from behind the party. So, in each residential area, let's say there's a chance for D4. Three. Four. Well, already the dice hate them. Eight. Eleven. Ow! That is fifteen corpses in the residence and Denny is making a sad face at me. I had corpses last time. Did you? Mm. Oh no, that was just corpses. These are corpses that are gonna kill you. Right, you're talking about the horrific uh view that you saw in um the uh Cave. Yeah, the werebear's cave of the uh, dead woman. No, no, these are corpses that will come back as Mike and his servants. Time for a horde battle. Let's hope someone decides to take an area effect spell. <laughs> None of them do. But that said, these are all going to be fairly low level enemies. So it's more just the fear of the numbers than there is anything else. So in the religious building, you'd expect there'd be a priest. Maybe some extras. Let's call it a d6 roll. Ah, the dice like them. We'll select one of the priests left. Uh, within the shops, you'd expect a couple of um, people to be around. Bakers, I'd say, be a bit more uh, lively. Let's go with uh, 2d4 for the bakers and a d6 d8 for the lunny lenders. d4 do not like the party. So in the bakers, there will be seven corpses. 
And in the money lenders, there'll be D8. Two. That's fine. The tavern. Now that you do expect a lot of people to be at a tavern. Mm, is there, how many of these are there already? So already they're going to be fighting 15, 22, 24, 25 enemies. So let's give it a fair chance. Let's call it a D12 roll. Four. So that gives me a total of 29 enemies from behind. Now what about in front? That's the uh, next question. So in front, there should be enough of these enemies to cause a small problem. Let's call it a 2d10 roll. 4 and 9. So that is 13. So that seems like a fair fight with some low-level Mykonid servants. Uh, we're talking 20, 30 to 42 enemies. Hey, mini universe. Fantastic. 42 enemies total. Now, let's find out what's in each of the building, and then let's roll up for the fight. So, in a residence, you'd expect a few bits and pieces. For that, we'll use the trinkets table on the uh, player's handbook. Now, I don't hear a lot of people talk about the trinkets table, I think because it's just such random things. But that's kind of the fun of it, surely. So, we're going to use a D100 and roll one for each room. Okay, that's a 91. A needle that never bends. A hmm. little bit of magic possibly in that residence, or just a nice bit of usefulness. Maybe you like that. Yeah, with that sewing thing. Okay, it's next. 84. A receipt of deposit at a distant city. So, that requires us to go to our own map, or my map in this case. Uh, I do kind of over plan my maps quite extensively, but that's just in case people decide to go somewhere I'm not fully expecting, so I have something ready. So, yeah, the next, the nearest major hub is um, a island called Sassum, with the capital being um, Yakti. So, a receipt of deposit. How much should it be for? How much? How much? Hmm. 41 gold. Actually, 410 gold. Make it reason for them to actually go after it. It might be that um, that 410 gold is actually uh, loot rather than um, monetary. Right, then we take another roll. 75. Bone pipes. I'm assuming, like, uh, with that, I'd say it's a musical instrument. And the last one is a nice 17, which gives us a glass orb. Very nice and simple. Okay, so that is what is in the residence. Not much to find. A couple of um, empty rooms, slowly filling with mould, few bodies in each. With that roll, four in... Uh, Three of them, th uh, th uh, three in the last one. Now, what about the religious building? We know there's one corpse in there, but in a religious building, we'd expect to find something a bit more of value. So, let's see what we have as choices here. Now, I'd personally definitely say that um, what would be in there would be um, some kind of holy symbol, perhaps a reliquary. So a reliquary, oh, perhaps a reliquary of uh, Giovanni. So it holds a relic of his being, maybe a scrap of his tunic. Look, he's still in here. <laughs> reliquary of Giovanni. Um, a flask of holy water.
Fantastic. And why not a couple bottles of wine? You're in a church, might as well get drunk. So, quickly turn to the lifestyle tech, harness, trade goods, lifestyle. Where is it? Ah, here we go, wine. Fine wine, call it, uh, let's go with a 2d6 roll, ah, fine wine times nine bottles, and maybe they'll find the old priest in a uh, prayer position. Now, of course, if the party decide to um, make any attempts at uh, burying the bodies or uh, burning the bodies there and then, they'll get a chance at reducing the number of enemies that come after them. Always reward players being clever or in character. We got to say something, love. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a um, Junji Ito short story I'm going to have to show you for an idea. Okay. Now, in the Money Lenders, there's going to be money. There's probably going to be a lot of money, to be fair. Um, could make it money. Money Lenders, they usually take collateral. So let's go to the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Actually, let's finish out the tavern and the uh, bakers, because they'll have fairly simple. The baker's not going to have much. Uh, maybe some cook's utensils. About it. Yep, some cook's utensils. I highly doubt any of the goods would have survived at this point. We're talking decades of time. Um, maybe some salt. Maybe just some salt. Now, what is the worth of salt? Ah, one pound of salt is five copper pieces. So let's give them ten pounds of salt. That will cover the remit for one of their missions. But they do have another job to take out the monster that is in the dungeon. Now, they could take the cow's weight and just do that and leave. That will have negative repercussions on them later. Maybe the Myconids turn up at some point during the fight, uh, while, during their stay. Maybe there are a few more people go missing. Maybe all sorts. Anything could happen. You as the game master decide what the correct punishment for players' choices are. Because even a good decision should have a punishment. And when I say punishment, it can be a reward as well. But... Any decision the players make should advance the plot. No matter how small. So we have that. And then back in the tavern, let's just throw some ale in. Fairly nice and simple, nothing much. Maybe call back to silver, see how much the ale is worth. And then go from there. So... Ale would be four copper pieces by the uh, mug, two silver by the gallon. Uh, let's say they find a couple of casks of um, uh, ale. So a cask, let's say, is 15 gallons. That seems fair to me. Uh, that would be 15 times 2, that would give us 30, that would be 3 gold pieces each. And let's see how many they find, if they can even take these out with them. 6. There we are. And let's say they find some money as well. This kind of place probably only uses silver. Let's roll out as 2d12 times 10 of silver. That's 18, that's a 7, 11, 18, so 180 silver pieces. Right, the money lenders. Now, I don't, now with there only being two people in the money lenders, I don't really expect there to be much in there. You'd think who would be the first people to get away from something, or who would be the most likely to send things out. And... A place that has a lot of valuable goods may have a way out, may have um, reason to send things further afield. So, let's give the party a chance at finding something. Let's say they make perception checks. And in those perception checks, 
they have a chance at finding set something. So on a 12 or more, let's say they find... Let's go to the Dungeon Master's Guide and look at some artwork. I don't know why the artwork counts towards jewellery as well, but hey, that's how they roll it out. So let's have a look. Here we go, some art objects. Let's say if they roll a 12, they get a 25 gold piece art object. What would be a piece of jewellery? What would be something that um, this village might have? Keep everything related to where it is. Don't suddenly throw out like a vorpal sword that's um, hidden under the desk of an office clerk. It doesn't make sense. It pulls people out of the immersion. You want to keep things to a um, level that makes sense. Uh, so let's opt for a small gold bracelet. That is worth 25 gold pieces. Now when the party find it you may want to embellish a bit, make it out that it's a chain bracelet, make it out that it's a chain link bracelet. Now, what happens if they roll better than 12? If they roll better than 12, they get the bracelet. If they roll better than 15, let's give them something off the 250 gold um, object. Now this one, you're going to be looking at something a bit more elaborate, a bit more overt. Let's roll a d10. We have a 1. A gold ring set with bloodstones. That's probably a bit too generous as a much sort of thing. Let's call that a 21. There we are. So if they're all better than 21, they will get the gold ring with bloodstone. What is the highest my party could roll in perception? I think the highest my party could roll in perception is with Arya using perception, um, which I believe she gets a plus 5 for. The highest possible is 25. So if Arya rolls a 20, gets 25, Let's reward something a bit more insane, a bit madder, a bit... You did very, very well at this roll. So if anyone in the party rolls 25 or higher, which, as I said, the only member of the party that might be able to would be Arya, the bard, the one who's currently sat in this room with me. Yeah, but I'm playing Animal Crossing, so... Works for me. You're not paying attention. Let's run it off something of the 2,500 GP art object. Reason being, it's, it's a 1 in 20 chance, come on. We have a 10. A necklace string of small pink pearls. Well, that's appropriate. So, if the party decide to actually look through the derelict village, which there'll be very little intent for them to. There won't be any real reason for them to. But if they decide to, this is what they have the chance of finding. It's not great stuff. It's nothing that's really going to help them in the coming fight. But they might decide to burn some of the corpses. And if they do that, there'll be less to fight with. Um, basically what I'll do is if they decide to burn down any of the buildings or burn any of the corpses, um, I will give them a roll to um, basically maybe make a percentile check, 50 chance of them coming out or not. On those odds, they may be able to reduce their number from 29 to 14, which makes the final fight 27. Now, what happens if you have a horde fight like this? You're not going to write out all the stats of every single one of them. So instead, work out where they came from and then roll those stats. So, we're going to have a potential of six places these micronets can come from. So, we make a column, make three columns with a split in the middle. And we name where each one came from. So, the first set come from the res, second set from the temple, third set from the moneylenders. 
fourth set from the tavern, fifth set from the bakers, and the last set from the mine. Now, this is where we start rolling for hit points. Now, there are 15 in the residence. All of them I'm already going as these are not going to be anything a particular challenge. These are going to be typical peasant stock. So, we take the Dungeon Master's Guide. And in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there are enemies that you can throw at them that... I mean, these enemies are also in the um, uh, Monster Manual. But, just as a quick check, you can use this one as well. Also, the Dungeon Master's Guide has a great number of um, ways of aligning challenge rating. So, here we are. That's the random treasure tables, which are amazing. The tricks and everything else for building a dungeon. Now, those are fun if you're building a dungeon that was built. I find it really Difficult to understand why they include dungeons that are built rather than dungeons that are more naturally formed. So mine shafts, caves, um, caverns, tunnels, that sort of thing. Just naturally occurring um, underground eventualities that the party may stumble across, that enemies may have filled. Right, let's use the monster manual instead. It is something quite difficult to understand, and it is something that I think a lot of Dungeon Masters would do with, to be honest. Right, these are all going to be human, to be honest, or human-like. Basically nothing so extreme as um, what the party has been coming across. Um, so we could run it off the um, bandit capacity, but let's see if there's an actual villager. Uh, commoner, here we are. Tens across the board, so it doesn't really matter much. That works for me. This is what we'll be rolling for the base mic. Ah, oh, that hit point is too little. Okay, let's take a look back at the mic in it. Here we go. Medusa, Mimic, Modron, Mummy, mic in it. So, let's find something we can use just to favour these two pages. Always have scrap paper handy. Just it makes life so much easier. So we use this one for the Myconid. And we use this one here so we can get an idea for the bandits. So we'll just use the bandit stats. Just easier. So what are the rules for the spore servant? Here we go. So the score changes as shows. Intelligence drops to 2, Wisdom to 6, and Charisma to 1. So we'd roll it off of those stats. Everything else stays the same. So all the speed by 10 feet to a minimum of 5 feet. So that, again, is something we need to make note of. Now, all these enemies are going to be humans. They'll have a speed of 30, so the speed gets dropped to 25. Which means they could catch up with Breslin, but none of the rest of the party. So, let's roll up some bandits. So, there's going to be 15 of these. And bandits in the book have a hit point range of 2d8 plus 2, which gives them an average hit point of 11. Now, you could just use it off the standard. But to be honest, with these kind of enemies, I would rather roll 2d8, and they all have the same hit point range. So, 2d8 plus 2. They're going to be very weak. I just rolled 3. But that said, a way of rolling up hit points for enemies. I do held dice. Two rolls. Only two rolls because that gives the players a fair chance and also means I can't do anything too overpowered. So if I like a number, I will hold the number. I don't like either of those numbers. So we re-roll. There we go. Bit better. 9 plus 2, 11 hit points. Turns out the average was correct. So all the residents will have 11 hit points. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now I'll put 11 15 times just so I can keep track of them. Any ones that get burnt, they just get crossed off as I go up the list. 
horde battles can be a bit of a pain to keep track of, but I heartily recommend them for causing a little bit of party uh, panic. Now, the way that uh, Mike and his work is they will use very simple weapons, if weapons at all, or use natural weapons. Now, I don't expect anyone in the residence to have any weapons, so let's roll off of unarmed combat for a human. D3 plus strength mod. They have, what was it? They have no bonuses to their strength mod, so they'll be doing D3 damage each. What will be their armor class? Their armor class will be, is it the natural armor or is it, yeah, 13. So the natural armor will be 10. So AC of 10. Fairly easy. These enemies I don't expect to last for very long uh, because every single one of the party members can do this much damage in one attack um, with, I believe, or not Breslin, um, Lenny being able to do this much damage very easily in one attack with the rest of them having to roll high for damage. But every single character will be hitting. That's it. So armor class of 10. That'll be the same for the money lenders. Same for the tavern, and same for the bakers. Now, if it's a priest, I think I'd throw him in a little bit of armour. Not much, just a little bit. But we'll get to that in a moment. And they do d3 damage apiece. And they have a plus... Does the Mycanid enhance their uh, chance to hit, or does it remain off their baseline? Ah, uh -huh. it remains off the baseline. Da, 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 da. Oh no, strike deals bludgeoning damage. Ah, here we are. So the damage modifier for the Myconids actually does change. They do unarmed bludgeoning attack of D4 plus the servant's strength damage. Now again, these bandits have no strength, so zero. And that works well. And they'll be getting a plus four plus three to hit. There's a lot of them. How to screw up a high level, how to screw a medium level party with a lot of uh, lot of enemies? Horde. Now, what will be in the temple will be a priest, a cleric, someone with a bit more age, someone with a bit more experience. So let's use the stats off of Let's call the stats off a of cult fanatic. I know that might be a bit offensive, but whatever. We'll use those hit stats. So cult fanatics have a hit stance of 68 plus 6. Now, again, because the objective this is a horde battle, 68, let's adjust the 68 to 66. Here we are. Because, hey, they're poisoned. And we'll not be doing held dice for this one either, so we'll just go at base because I just rolled two sixes and a five. Um, so that's 12, 17, 20, 22 plus 6, 28 hit points for the priest. That seems fine, that is only just below the average of a standard cult fanatic. They would normally have a dagger, but in this case let's give that um, priest a club which we go to the player's handbook to get the points of and they would get a plus four to hit oh in terms of your stats by the way always remember to mark your um notes of like how high they need to roll to do damage um in brackets so you don't confuse it with your uh, to hit. Okay, so here we go, weapons. Let's give him... Let's give him a mace. Simple enough. A bit more damage than a standard club. So the, cl so the mace does d6. Any strength modifier? No. So d6 damage. Nice and simple. So the priest is going to be easy for that. The money lenders. Let's make them. Let's give them some leather armor. Actually, let's make them a bit sturdier. We'll roll again off the bandit table. So two d8 plus two, and we'll hold dice. No held dice there. There were two in the money lenders, and I rolled a fifteen. So seventeen hit points a pop. 
and let's give them a couple of short swords each. So, say as they were the moneylenders' guards, or someone who was meant to go and collect something and got caught up in the Myconid infestation. So a short sword does d6 damage with plus 1, and they will roll at a plus 5 to hit. Okay, so still, nothing too absurd. Um, always remember to take note of, for experience worth, take note of what challenge rating everything is. So the residents are a quarter um, difficulty. The temple is a half difficulty, as is the money lenders. The tavern, again, there'll be a quarter, because that will be um, baseline, same with the bakers. The mine, um, there'll be miners, so there'll be a half. And we'll work out experience from this fight in just a moment. So, the uh, so the tavern, everyone that's just going to be a basic uh, civilian again, will roll off the hit points as before. Bandits, 2d8 plus 2. That works, 11, 13. So again, still nothing all impressive. The tavern had four people. And they will be doing fist damage, so d4 with a plus three to hit. Again, nothing too much. Same with the bakers, of which there were seven in the bakers. So, their hit points. Uh, I'll reroll that too. Got a one. Ah, well. So that could have been eight. Turns out they've got seven hit points. And there are seven in there. Seven, seven, seven. Well, that just seems appropriate. Again, they'll be doing at D4, with the exception of one of them, who I will mark with an asterisk. So the rest will do D4 and hit on a plus 3. That one there will basically be there with a rolling pin, which I will call a um, club weapon, which will do D4 plus 2 damage, whereas the rest are doing D4 plus 0, something a bit more challenging. And let's say he's proficient with that, because he was the baker, so plus five. So still, again, nothing overly impressive to fight against. Now the mine shaft. The mine, we need something a bit different. So miners, they're used to what they're doing. They're, they've probably got some weapons or some kit that they can be thrown around with. And there's going to be 13 of them coming up from the mine shaft. What can we throw at them? Just easily, what can we throw at them? I mean, gladiators have way too much hit points. Easily could probably throw guards at them, because again, they don't have many hit points. Um, unfortunately, there isn't really a minor option. I guess really that would come under uh, civilians, uh, members of the public, that sort of thing. So I guess we'll probably do the same. Ah, sorry about that. No, oh, the uh, residents are a one-eighth threat. The moneylenders are a quarter threat. And the bakers are also a one-eighth threat, as is the tavern. There we go. These kind of quarter things get a bit confusing. Um, while I'm here, let's just work out some experience point gain. So one-eighth, which is 25 experience points, times 15, so 25 times 15, that's 250 for 10, and 125 for 5, that is 375 EXP from the residence. The temple is a half, which would be 100. The money lenders are a quarter, which is 50 apiece, so another 100. The tavern has four at one eighth, that's 100. And the baker's has 7 at 1 8, so if that was 8, that'd be 200. Um, to be honest with that one with the rolling pin, I'm going to call it an even 200. It should be 175, but I'll call it 200. So, we're now starting to get an idea of how much experience points the party will receive just from this first encounter going into the dungeon. And bloody hell, this is already going on for an hour, I might do this as a multi-part video. So, let's throw 13 guards at them. 
Again, that sounds scary, but the guards themselves are much the same as the bandits. It's just they have slightly better stats. I think a 1 8 is unfair. I'm going to call this a 1 4. Mm, no, 1 8. I'm not going to adjust the hit points in any way. I'm um, still calling the 2d8 plus 2. So, how many hit points do the miners have? That's a 1 and a 3. I'm re rolling both dice. That should have helped 3. Um, that is a 9, 11 hit points. Again, weirdly enough, the average comes up. So, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There we are. Now, the armor class on these guys will be a bit better. I imagine it would be leather. So we'll call their armor class 11. So, again, nothing here is too difficult to hit. Mm, I'd say they're a bit hardier, so let's make it a 12. How long is it? I didn't have to do the armor class for the priest at the temple. Let's call it um, basic chainmail, so 14. So he's got the highest hit points and it's the hardest to hit. So he's sort of the boss as a character, but you can't really call him a boss. He's only got 28 hit points. And when you've got a character rolling around 2d12 plus uh, 5 damage, I'm not worried about that. Again, this is why we need to gradiate these kind of things, because these sort of fights can get out of control very quickly. Now, 13 times 25, 12 would have it at 300, so 325. So the experience points that the party is actually going to gain from finishing this fight will be 0, just doing the maths, seriously, games mastering, it's all nonsense and maths, 7, 9, that becomes another 10, so there we go, carry the 1, 3, 6, 9, 10, 12. So, from one encounter, this equals 1,200 experience points. For a band of four adventurers at level three, the experience point value should be about 1,500 for a deadly encounter, 1,200. This is a hard fight. As level fours, this would still be considered a medium to hard fight. The issue here is more the numbers, not so much um, what they're fighting, just how many there are. Now, we just need to very quickly arm the uh, miners, and then we'll go into part two, the actual dungeon. How are you doing, love? I'm fine, um, but we will probably have to go and do that shop you found soon. Yeah, no worries. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do part one, and then we'll go, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's because you're going to cut this bit. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, I'm going to um, go and sort myself out because I'm just getting dressed and things. Uh. No worries, love. I'll see you in a bit, yeah? Love you. Love you. Okay, so realistically they'd have some kind of uh, mining weapon, a pickaxe or something. Uh, I don't get why there isn't stats for a pickaxe. It, it seems like an obvious thing to have, especially as an um, improvised weapon. But let's adjust that. So they all have pickaxes which will be two handed weapons and let's run up them off the hmm, yeah we'll run it off the oh would the great club make more sense what if we use a two handed weapon in basic weaponry we're going to call it a great club basically we're going to use the great club stats which do d8 damage these guys are going to get a d8 plus two damage and it will be piercing damage as well And they will run on a plus four to hit. So again, this encounter, it sounds scarier than it is. If they don't decide to burn it and just go at this as just go through, try and get to the other side, they will have 42 uh, Mike and his servants. All basic civilians, all basic villagers, most of which will go down in one hit. It's the number that will cause the most fear. So, hope you enjoyed that little setup. The next video will be the party going into the mine because if they are not stupid, they will take a long rest before going in. 
I expect them to use some spell slots. I expect them to take a bit of a beating and need some healing. But then again, that's why they have both a paladin and a bard. So, hope you enjoyed that video. Like and subscribe for any ones in the future. Um, and if you like this, please join me for part two, where I will start building the actual dungeon. Bye.